Um, Andy, can you see my mouse? I can, yes. Okay, perfect. Just give this another moment here for people to file in. Yeah, no worries. And everyone, welcome to the Quantitative Seminar. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Andy Whitehouse. I'm a student in the Essington Lab here at SAFS. Uh, and today we are excited, excited to welcome Dr. Lisa McManus to speak uh, today. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot Nations. Um, and let's see here, uh, before we begin, just to orient everyone to the platform here, um, uh, um, if you have any questions during the talk, you can enter them into the questions box, which you'll find on the control panel, usually on the right hand side of your screen. And then we'll direct those questions uh, to Lisa and she can field those during the talk. And then there'll be time for more questions at the end of the talk. And at that time, uh, people can also use the raise your hand feature and we can uh, selectively uh, unmute people so they can ask questions. Um, so as I said, uh, today our speaker is Dr. Lisa McManus. Uh, Lisa is a marine ecologist and theoretician. Her research focuses on the ecological and evolutionary drivers of coral reef dynamics, especially the response of coral populations to climate change. She earned a bachelor's degree in marine and atmospheric science from the University of Miami and a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton. Lisa was subsequently a postdoctoral fellow at Rutgers University, and she has recently started a faculty position this fall at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. So with that, uh, let me bring our speaker. Welcome, Lisa. Hey, thank you, Andy. And also thank you to Tim Essington for the invitation. So let's see. Okay, so uh, the work I'll be presenting today is based off of my postdoctoral research, which was conducted at Rutgers University. Um, and this work was part of a larger grant called Modeling Adaptive Potential, and it was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And so there were two overarching goals of this project. The first was to um, develop novel theory regarding coral reef adaptation. And the second part was to link this theory to real world conservation applications. And so I want to thank the larger team. Um, we had collaborators from the University of Washington, from the Coral Reef Alliance, from Rutgers University, of course, um, as well as folks from Stanford University and University of Queensland. And um, this is a photo taken after um, one of our meetings while we were in Honduras last year. So just want to thank a wonderful group of people. So this is a photo of a healthy coral reef taken in 2012, um, and this was on the Great Barrier Reef. You'll notice a couple things. You'll notice that there's a lot of coral and that they are diverse and structurally complex. So there's all these different kinds of forms. Some are branching, plate-like, or domed. Um, and while reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, their structural complexity provides habitat for about a quarter of all marine life. And those estimates range from about hundreds of thousands to millions of species. Unfortunately, corals are being subjected to a variety of stressors, including warming waters, uh, that causes them to expel their photosynthetic symbionts during bleaching events. And so while reefs can recover from bleaching, um, prolonged exposure, especially to very high temperatures, can lead to mass mortality. And without live corals that are actively secreting their calcium carbonate skeletons, the reef can end up in a degraded state, much like in this photo, 
where it is much less structurally complex and can no longer support the same levels of diversity. So people around the world depend on coral reefs. And in fact, it is estimated that about 850 million people um, live within 100 kilometers of a coral reef. And so I just want to show a couple of figures that uh, address the ecosystem services that reefs provide. So this is um, across the range of the reef. So here, darker colors indicate a higher reliance on these services. And some of those services include uh, reef fisheries, of course, for income, livelihoods, um, as well as a dependence on shoreline protection. And so uh, just want to point out that of these 850 million people, uh, approximately three quarters are from poor developing nations. So it really is critical that we try to protect um, these ecosystems. So unfortunately, coral bleaching has increased since it was first documented in the 80s. And so um, reef building corals obtain most of their energy from uh, their photosynthetic symbionts called zooxanthellae. So this is a close up of a coral polyp and uh, these little circles are the zooxanthellae. And so under stress, stress such as high heat, um, the zooxanthellae uh, experiences damage to its photosynthetic machinery, and uh, this can lead to cell cellular damage to both the symbiont and the host. And um, oftentimes, uh, the symbionts are um, expelled from the coral, and while the coral can uptake, uh, uh, can reuptake back the zooxanthellae, there can be mass coral mortality if conditions don't improve. And so this figure is from a study led by Terry Hughes. And in blue, they're showing uh, the decreasing number of unbleached locations, so reef locations through time. And in red, they're showing um, the increasing cumulative number of bleaching events. And I wanted to put this up for a couple of takeaways. First, nearly all reefs have experienced a bleaching event at this point. And the second is that unfortunately the frequency has been increasing. And this is distressing because recovery is more difficult when there are back-to-back -back bleaching events. So uh, having said all that, this talk is not about doom and gloom. And I argue that we are now just starting to uncover the different mechanisms by which coral populations uh, might be able to adapt to environmental change. So for example, um, in one paper led by Kleypas et al, they calculated bleaching thresholds across the Coral Triangle reef network in the Indo-Pacific. And here they assumed that um, populations are adapted to local conditions. So they looked at historical temperature. Um, they then recalculated these bleaching thresholds uh, based on uh, now larval dispersal probabilities. Um, and they got this, these larval dispersal probabilities based on an ocean circulation model. So here, the sites in blue were calculated to have a lower bleaching threshold because of dispersal, while sites in red were recalculated to have a higher bleaching threshold. So uh, the takeaway from this work is that uh, reefs uh, can receive larvae that uh, both increase and decrease the bleaching thresholds. Um, but while these are important insights, this work doesn't have any population dynamics. So there's no um, competition or um, any evolutionary dynamics considered here. In another work um, in the same region, uh, this work was led by uh, Misha Matz and others. So in this case, they had a genetic model with migration, and they also simulated warming based on temperature projections. And so what I'm showing you now is um, a metric that they called PRO5, which is the proportion of immigrants from reefs that were uh, greater than or equal to half a degree. And they found that this particular metric was a very strong predictor of reef persistence. So here, um, the warmer colors uh, indicate sites that receive a larger amount of warm adapted larvae. And now in this figure, um, they're showing coral cover 
um, at the end of year 100 um, after one of their simulations. And so again, uh, the warmer colors indicate higher coral cover, while, while darker colors indicate lower coral cover. So you can see that PRO5 um, is a pretty good predictor of what the final coral cover would be um, under temperature warming simulations. So the key questions um, I'll be addressing today in this talk are, first, I'll be uh, presenting a study where we try to understand how dispersal network structure affects ecoevolutionary dynamics. The second talk, um, or the second part of this talk, will be about uh, trying to figure out what reef factors um, lead to either persistence and decline under simulations. And finally, um, the third part of this talk, um, I'll be talking about ongoing work where we're trying to take what we've found out from these other two parts um, and apply that to questions in conservation. So kind of a now what, like what does this mean in terms of spatial management going into the future? So I spent, I know I spent a while talking about um, corals, but the first part of this talk is really more general. And um, it's here that I'll be presenting the underlying um, model that uh, forms the basis of the other studies as well. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, please feel free to ask questions during the talk, um, especially um, for the modeling component. So again, uh, in this first part, we're addressing this first question. So um, in nature, many organisms inhabit discrete patches, and this is mostly a result of physiological, behavioral, and ecological constraints of the organism, but it can also be due to human-induced fragmentation. Um, and in these spatially structured populations, dispersal is a fundamental process that influences dynamics and persistence. So for the purpose of this talk, um, I'll be talking about networks. Um, so the nodes here are the habitat patches, and they are linked by the movement of individuals through dispersal. And so in organisms such as corals, reef fish, and flowering plants, for example, we focus on dispersal that occurs during early life history, since this is when these organisms will travel the farthest in their lifetime. And so again, I'll be focusing on these dispersal networks, um, as well as how they affect eco-evolutionary processes, um, especially in response uh, to environmental change. So uh, previous modeling work has shown that um, when communities are along an environmental gradient, they respond differently to increasing temperatures, uh, especially in terms of their reliance um, on ecological versus evolutionary processes. So in one study, uh, Norberg et al. simulated dynamics across a linear set of patches, such that um, in um, the warmest sites were in the middle, representing the equator, and the cooler sites were at the ends, representing the poles. And these communities were connected with um, simple dis uh, dispersal, approximated with diffusion. And so they, um, they subjected this community to temperature increase and they found that uh, the response in cold regions was primarily through dispersal. And this was because there were already existing traits in the network that were pre-adapted to the warming conditions. And uh, therefore, could these, um, these individuals could successfully colonize the cold sites that were warming. Um, however, warm sites had to rely on local selection since there were no pre-adapted traits in the network that could rescue the populations there. So while uh, the previous work and uh, in fact a, a large body of eco-evolutionary studies um, had relatively simple dispersal, some studies have explored how more complex dispersal uh, affects ecological stability and persistence in populations. So in this 
body of work, uh, two of the most commonly explored networks are regular and random networks. So patches in regular networks are connected only to their nearest neighbors, right? Uh, whereas in random networks, uh, you can have connections between near and far patches, and this creates connectivity shortcuts across the network. Uh, in regular networks, uh, they're characterized by having a high average path length. So if you take any two patches, the number of other patches you'd have to pass through um, is, is consistently high, whereas in uh, random networks, the average path length is much lower. So what does this mean, right? So in terms of uh, the ecological dynamics, regular networks have low synchrony and synchrony has strong implications for persistence because as population abundance fluctuates um, at a particular patch, demographic rescue is more likely when a depleted patch is connected to a site that has um, higher abundance. So in regular networks, sites exhibit high and lows in abundance at the same time, leading to a high risk of extinction. Um, however, on random networks, uh, the, the shortcuts um, kind of break this synchrony and uh, you get patches that are more independent of each other, such that uh, a patch experiencing a lower abundance is more likely to be connected to a patch uh, that is experiencing higher abundance. And this leads to overall higher abundance in random networks. So just summarizing what I've told you about so far, um, we know that patches along a thermal gradient respond differently to increasing temperature. And um, however, this work has highly simplified dispersal. Um, whereas I just told you, random networks lead to higher persistence than in regular dispersal networks, but this work typically doesn't include um, environmental heterogeneity or evolutionary dynamics. So in this paper, we're putting together these ideas to ask how network structure influences um, eco-evolutionary response of populations to a changing environment um, when patches are uh, heterogeneous. Okay, so uh, this is where I'll be going over the equations that underlie um, this study as well as the other two parts of this talk. So we're tracking um, two main aspects of each local population. We're tracking the first, the change in abundance. And the second thing we're tracking is the change in mean trait value. And here by trait value, uh, what I'm talking about is the optimal growth temperature. And um, by optimal growth temperature, and I'll talk more about this um, in the subsequent slides, but when your mean trait value perfectly matches uh, the current temperature, that's when the population grows the fastest. So uh, in word and cartoon form, uh, the change in abundance depends on population dynamics, so growth and mortality. It also depends on immigration. Um, individuals from the other patches will be arriving um, into the patch based on the type of dispersal network. And finally, um, the change in abundance also depends on the genetic load. And again, I'll talk more about this, but um, basically this is a penalty for um, having a lot of genetic variation in a patch. So uh, the change in mean trait value is then governed by gene flow. Of course, individuals are coming from different patches and they are going to be adapted to different environments. And this trait value is also subject to selection. So there's a selective force that wants to push that mean trait value towards matching um, the environmental temperature or the local temperature at that site. Um, so if it's if it becomes warmer, there's a push to increase that trait value. And if it suddenly dips, uh, gets colder, there's a push to uh, push that towards uh, lower values. 
So the system um, is coupled um, ordinary differential equations, some ODEs. So again, change in abundance, population dynamics, uh, immigration, and the genetic load. So first I'm going to dig into this population dynamics term. And so here that G is the fitness of, um, of, of patch uh, I, right? So I is the patch index, um, N is the abundance, and fitness here depends on growth and mortality. So now, so I'll be digging into this part further now. Again, okay, so fitness is governed by growth here, R, and uh, mortality. And here we're actually tracking um, a relative abundance. So abundance goes from zero to one. Um, so growth is um, assumed to be Gaussian um, and it's uh, based on this equation here and this W, um, you can think about it as the width of the thermal tolerance. Um, and so maximum growth is actually this whole term here, which uh, depends on uh, this R0, which is a growth scaling factor. Um, and basically what, what I want um, you all to understand from this is just that here, uh, here I have the difference between the current temperature and the mean trait value, right? When they are perfectly matching, again, is when the population is growing the fastest and growth declines when there's a mismatch here. So that's basically all that that component is saying. Mortality is a little different. So here we don't impose additional mortality if it's cooler than what the population um, trait value is currently. But if the current temperature is warmer than the trait value, we impose exponential mortality. So then when you combine these two pieces, what you end up with is this um, asymmetric fitness where basically it's more uh, detrimental for the population to have a temperature that is higher than mean trait value. Um, and it's more okay for the current temperature to be cooler. And this type of asymmetric fitness is actually um, uh, empirically seen in many ectothermic systems. So <laughs> that was just uh, the first piece. That was just the population dynamics piece. So uh, now the change in abundance also depends on immigration. So uh, basically this term L is really just accounting for um, the dispersal network. So it's looking at uh, taking this connectivity matrix, right? And so each element in that matrix uh, DIJ is the probability of reaching patch I from patch J. Um, and so we're taking into account all those connection strengths and the current abundances at those sites. Um, and this beta is a fecundity term. So this is just a way to uh, take into account uh, how many, and you can think of it as how many individuals are coming into a patch. And finally, um, all I want to say about uh, this genetic load, so that V is the additive genetic variance and it's the amount of genetic variation present in the population. Um, again, G is fitness and Z is the mean trait value. And I mentioned earlier this was a cost. So if you remember the, um, oops, the asymmetric mortality, uh, asymmetric fitness I talked about earlier because of that shape, this term is always um, either zero or negative. So this is a cost to um, having that genetic variation. So that was the change in abundance. Now for the change in mean trait value, um, this depends on gene flow and selection. So um, not only are individuals coming in, but these individuals are coming from patches where they are adapted to different conditions, right? So um, we need to take into account that, uh, that amount of individuals, but also the trait values they're bringing in. And how I like to think about this is at each patch uh, during settlement or before settlement, there's uh, this cloud of larvae that is trying to come settle. So 
we need to calculate um, that incoming trait value. Again, Z um, is the mean trait value at each population. Um, and so this Y ends up being um, the incoming trait value of that larval cloud. But of course, um, we need to scale this term um, by, oops, oh, first, right. So first we want to uh, scale the incoming trait value by the total amount of immigration. And then we subtract uh, the current trait value at that population. And so this component here is the maximum trait change, right? Is it, you know, plus five or um, minus one uh, degree, for example. And then this term depends on a couple of other things as well. First, is there even free space? Is there, um, is there space for these new immigrants to settle? So that makes a difference. The second part is what fraction um, of the total population is represented by these immigrants? So basically um, immigrants have the largest effect on trait value if there's a lot of free space, right? If there's, uh, if there's no other individual there um, and if they comprise a large component of the current population. And then finally, we have uh, the selection component. Again, it's that force that is pushing the trait value to, um, to match with the current environmental conditions. And uh, the only thing new here is that we have this Q, um, Q parameter that basically reduces this effect when population sizes are very, very, very small. Okay, so. Those were definitely the tough slides. Um, and again, so I, I won't be showing more of that. Um, those are the equations that underlie uh, the rest of the talk, basically. So again, we looked at a regular and a random network for our simulations. Um, we had 20 patches each, um, and each patch was connected to four others. So we had um, first a constant scenario. We ran that for about 1500 years. And then we subjected um, the populations to increasing temperatures. Um, and here we had temperature level off after about um, 250 years or so. So here um, sites that are warmer relative to the network are colored in red and sites that are relatively cooler are in blue. We also tested here the effect of um, our additive genetic variance, which is a proxy for evolutionary potential. So when there's no genetic variance in a population, you can imagine that everyone has that same mean trait value. Whereas if you have high genetic variance, um, there are individuals that have different trait values. Um, and so this makes evolution um, faster basically, but again, there's also that cost um, in terms of genetic load. So we also looked at uh, different levels of system openness. So in a closed system, um, you're basically not receiving any immigrants from other patches, whereas in an open system, um, the links to other patches and your own self-recruitment link have the same connection strength. So uh, we also looked at, of course, um, intermediate scenarios. Okay, so what do the results look like? Um, so let me remind you that, uh, again, from all that ecological work, uh, we, when there's no evolutionary component, we expect random networks to lead to higher abundance. So here, what I'm showing you now um, are uh, log ratios. So we have, we, um, we have regular um, over random. So down here is when random does better than regular and up here, um, random, or sorry, here random is better, here regular networks are better. So I'll first show you um, constant temperature. Uh, and this is um, averaged across all the patches in the network. So I'll also be showing three levels of V, that additive genetic variance. So okay, under constant temperatures, we see that random networks do better when there's 
um, no, no evolution essentially, or no additive genetic variants, which is good because this captures kind of a long-standing result. But you see when we start incorporating additive genetic variants or that strength of evolution, uh, we see this flip to now we have um, regular networks as being, um, as being more abundant. And same here when additive genetic variance is quite high. So under increasing temperature, we see similar result. Um, wouldn't take to put too much stock in this result. Basically, um, when there's no additive genetic variance and temperatures are increasing, um, all the patches die. Um, and then here we see that random networks still do better, but then we get that flip um, at higher additive genetic variants. So these are network level results I just showed, um, but what's happening, right? And so to understand the mechanisms driving these patterns, uh, we need to look at what's happening at the patch scale. So here I'll be showing trajectories for each patch uh, colored by temperature. Um, so we'll have the relative abundance as well as the mean trait value over time. And these particular results are for um, intermediate genetic variants um, and an open system, but they're illustrative of uh, trajectories for other parameter combinations. So here in the regular network, um, so cold patches maintain pretty high abundance throughout, right? Um, and warm and intermediate patches uh, experience decline, but then they seem to recover when the temperature stabilizes. However, in the random network, um, while we see the cold patches acting similarly, uh, warm and intermediate patches experience decline and are unable to recover. And so um, in both of these networks, the cold patches um, are increasing faster during rising temperatures because of the influx of warm adapted individuals. So uh, that aspect of uh, facilitated adaptation. And then as these cold, um, cold populations become disproportionately abundant in the network. They contribute more cold adapted individuals uh, to the network and this leads to gene swamping in warmer patches. Um, since of course uh, the cold individuals were not helping patches that were relatively warmer. So we can see this when we look at the mean trait values over time. Um, in the regular network cold patches were directly connected um, to warm and, oops, sorry, yeah, in the, sorry, in the random network, cold patches were directly connected to um, warm and intermediate patches, and this led to this convergence of trade values that was really only beneficial at the cooler sites. So, um, to conclude here, um, evolutionary potential seems to reverse theoretical predictions regarding persistence in these networks. Um, when there was no evolutionary potential, random networks were better than regular networks. Um, but when there was high evolutionary potential, um, regular networks uh, performed better. Um, and this was because regular networks facilitated local adaptation um, since they weren't um, as affected by the gene swamping um, that uh, really affected the warm and intermediate patches um, in the random networks. So um, yeah, so network structure and environmental heterogeneity really make a difference. Let's see. Okay, so uh, that first part was uh, very general and uh, now we're taking that model um, and those findings, and we're now applying them back to coral reef systems. And so what we really wanted to understand here was what were the, um, what were the characteristics of reefs, both at the patch level and at the network level that determine their persistence, right? Um, there's been a lot of work or at least a good amount of work on this, uh, metapopulation dynamics on coral reefs, but that work tends to exclude evolutionary dynamics. So we're trying to understand evolving coral populations in this study. 
So um, the main modification to the model is that now we have, instead of one species, there's two species. So we have um, two coral species. One is fast growing and has a narrow thermal tolerance. So again, that uh, W, that width of thermal tolerance I talked about earlier. So that's different between the two. Um, and we also have a slow growing species with a wider thermal tolerance. So um, we tested the effects of genetic variants by running the simulation under different assumptions of V. So again, we have uh, no genetic variants to very high levels of genetic diversity. And then um, we constructed general uh, linear models to understand the impact of temperature and connectivity metrics on the um, persistence or decline of individual reefs. Okay, so um, we focused on three regions, the Caribbean, the Coral Triangle region, and the Indo-Pacific and the Southwest Pacific. So for each of these um, regions, we, um, we used connectivity matrices. So these are those dispersal networks. Um, we used them, um, they were based from um, larval dispersal simulations based on ocean circulation models. So these were all um, published in the literature already. Um, we then ran, um, we had a hindcast part um, of our temperature series and then we ran um, simulations under RCP 4.5 and 8.5 until uh, the year 2300. Um, and so, oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, we ran these simulations until 2300. And these regions had different numbers of sites. So the Caribbean, for example, had about 400 something and Coral Triangle had uh, 2000 something sites. Um, so quite different. Our main result was that um, the primary driver is basically additive genetic variants. So again, it's the amount of genetic variation present in the system. And so what I'm showing here uh, first for the Caribbean is coral cover up top, right? So the solid line here uh, represents RCP 4.5, so a less severe scenario and RCP 8.5, uh, which is our more severe scenario. And here um, I have the, so this is the, I think this is the actual temperature. Um, um, these are the trait values that are associated with um, each of these runs. So again, these are um, network wide. So up top, coral cover, um, down below, we have that mean trait value. So basically when we have high levels of additive genetic variants, it doesn't matter what the temperature scenario is because um, the network, the coral network survives either way. So this is what it looks like for the Caribbean and results were similar for the Southwest Pacific and the Coral Triangle. And so you'll also notice here uh, for high V, the mean trade value tracks the actual temperature really well. So in contrast, we can look at uh, simulations when there isn't any genetic variance, right? So in this case, right, we have um, these purple trajectories and here basically everything dies, right? Uh, some declines are slower than others depending on the region. Um, of course, RCP 4.5 um, simulations do a little better but basically uh, when there's no additive genetic variants, uh, populations don't do very well. When we look at intermediate values, um, it gets a little more interesting. So now we have the teal line. So now what we're seeing is that under a less severe scenario, the population or the network as a whole is able to persist, while under RCP 8.5, population 
uh, leads to extinction. And so, again, this is what we found for uh, the Caribbean as well as the other two regions. So, so now there's kind of this interactive effect between uh, the amount of genetic variation, the strength of evolution, um, as well as the exact temperature time series we used. So, of course, I was showing you just network-wide effects, but we have um, these data across the region. Um, so, for example, um, here's what initial and minimum covers look like for the Caribbean. Um, so this is all fully spatial, and I just wanted to highlight that. Remember, we also had the two species, and in general, um, so these are results for RCP 4.5, and in general, what we saw here is that the fast coral, so in orange, fast coral declines more quickly, but then is able to recover quickly as well. And so this is what the corresponding trait values look like. So uh, the slow coral takes a longer time to decline, and at least here it seems to be uh, recovering, um, but definitely not as fast as a response as the fast coral. And again, similar dynamics um, in Southwest Pacific and the Coral Triangle as well. And um, what's what's interesting about having the two species is that it, it they really kind of compensate for each other through time. So first we see this fast coral decline, but the slow coral kind of maintains cover, but then eventually we do see the fast coral recovering. So in terms of ecosystem function, um, it does seem particularly important to acknowledge or consider that diversity. So I mentioned we um, took a look at some, or we constructed some GLMs uh, just to kind of quantify the effects of various metrics. And I'm not going to go over everything here, um, but I just want you to pay attention to this orange line, or this orange dot, so that's initial sea surface temperature. It's a measure, um, it basically tells you how hot or cold the site was relative to the network, um, as well as this yellow line, which is the destination strength. So here we're showing you the coefficient values um, under three levels of uh, genetic variance, basically. So when there's no genetic vari variation, um, these coefficients are more important. They have larger magnitudes. Um, and so the positive coefficient for destination strength tells us that more incoming larvae is a strong predictor of persistence. Um, and the negative value for the temperature is saying that being relatively cooler is an important predictor. Um, you'll notice, however, so these are similar um, results across the three regions. And you'll notice that um, as genetic variation increases, everything becomes less important because that evolutionary term is really uh, the primary driver of these dynamics. So just to conclude this part, so um, obviously evolutionary potential is critical. So that genetic variation term um, is basically the strongest predictor of whether or not the coral reef network will persist. And then um, in terms of the level of a particular, of a single reef, a higher destination strength, so higher larval input is important, uh, kind of regardless of the identity, particular identity of those larvae in terms of trait value. And having a relatively cooler temperature um, seems to predict a higher minimum and final cover. And so again, I think, you know, based on the previous paper, we kind of know, we kind of have a, a good understanding that that's because of the pre-adapted warm larvae that are coming in to um, allow fast adaptation at the cooler sites. Um, and so for this last part, um, I just briefly want to go over um, the conservation part, spatial management strategies, and I want to acknowledge that uh, this work was in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy as well. Um, 
And this work is very much ongoing, um, not as much done as the other two parts. Um, but, you know, now we're taking what we know and we're trying to figure out what this means for conservation in the future. Um, and it's pretty much the same framework as in the previous uh, study, but now we have included a macroalgal competitor. Um, but I do want to point out that the macroalgae doesn't uh, experience any immigration or evolution. Um, it really is just there to be a competitor to the two coral species. And so, how do we how do we designate um, these marine protected areas, right? So, basically, we've added that algae. And what we can do now is that when we designate a site as a marine protected area, we um, allow algal mortality to be higher than at the other sites, right? So, and this is, you know, pretty vague, but it can mean um, that the herbivore population is more well-managed, for example, um, can also mean that maybe there's more efforts towards um, uh, controlling a nutrient input, um, for example. So, uh, but in terms of the math, it just means that the algae die more if it's a marine protected area. And so, uh, some of the strategies we've been looking at include protecting cold sites, hotter sites, um, sites with ID larvae, which are basically sites that receive um, warmer adapted larvae. Um, there's also um, centrality metric um, that basically is the major larval sources. Um, we looked at evenly spacing um, the sites um, and we also looked at isolated sites. So just to kind of show you what that looks like, um, this is um, a map where we've now implemented MPAs on 30% of the network. So again, just briefly, um, so these are the different MPA strategies. Um, I'm showing results for the Caribbean only right now. So we compare these results to random runs. So these, uh, these skinny little box plots are the random runs. Um, and I'm showing you results for when we take into account the full network, um, sites that were only designated as MPAs and sites that were only outside of MPAs. And so this is minimum abundance and final abundance. Uh, they show similar uh, patterns. And so basically it's tough to beat just randomly implementing MPAs. Um, random networks tend to benefit the full network as well as um, non-MPA sites. And not surprisingly, ID larvae and cold strategies uh, led to higher cover inside MPAs. Um, and this part makes sense. So hot and isolation strategies lead to relatively high final cover um, in non-MPA sites. Um, we still need to kind of figure out why isolation worked so well. Um, for example, these sites uh, probably have different, um, or probably have temperature or um, destination or like larval input strengths that are similar to other strategies. Um, but again, still can't get away from the effect of evolution or genetic variance. So um, I am now showing you the uh, same graph. So I was showing you results for intermediate genetic variance, but here's what it looks like when there's no genetic variance, all the final abundances or coral cover are lower. Whereas if you increase the genetic variance, um, the abundance also increases as well. Um, and just wanna uh, talk briefly about some ongoing work. We are currently working um, with uh, collaborators at the Coral Reef Alliance and Nature Conservancy. Um, we're trying to analyze the networks that are in place now and see if we can identify any that are missing that would be beneficial. Um, we're also test or simulating different um, ways of expanding the MPA network. Um, and also um, there's work led by Lucas De Filippo where we're looking at a similar, um, similar study, but looking at restoration. And, I just want to 
end today with some future, uh, some final thoughts. Um, basically, genetic variance is critical, and I think this really, the results really point to the fact that we need to be quantifying this more, and we need to understand um, what maintains genetic variance. Um, how do we, how do we keep it at high levels? Um, what are the underlying factors? So, for example. A site can have many microhabitats, um, so maybe that is an important determinant of genetic variance. Um, second is I think uh, we need to try to understand how well or how how good we are at um, capturing real-world ecoevolutionary dynamics. So. Um, at least as part of um, my research program, I want to collaborate with empiricists and basically test the model and see if we find these signs of gene swamping of local adaptation um, in real reefs. And finally, we need to understand the role of spatial scale. Um, a lot of our simulations were on these very massive scales and how these results apply uh, scaled even higher or uh, to a finer scale remain um, not understood. So with that, I just want to thank all of you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Good, thank you, Lisa. That was a great yeah. talk. Thank you. Uh, we'll give folks a few moments here to... Yeah, it, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you have a question for Lisa, um, please type it into the question box, or, or you can alternatively you can raise your hand. There we go. So the question is, do I think genetic variants would help the potential threats of bleaching? So, so yes, basically um, what we found was that when there was greater genetic variants, um, the populations were much better at tracking, um, tracking the local temperature. Um, so uh, I think that is quite critical. Um, of course, there's um, there's kind of the the other end of that, in that um, if you have too much genetic variance, then you have a lot of individuals that aren't going to be perfectly adapted. But um, in this in this kind of system that's rapidly changing, and we actually we know exactly how it's changing, right? It's getting warmer. Um, I think uh, the genetic variance is definitely critical. So. Um, one of the studies I showed was tracking the bleaching threshold. Um, so if there was more variation around that, then that could certainly um, select for, so rising temperatures could select for um, strains that have higher thresholds. Um, so yes, I think genetic variance is, is very, very important. So thank you. And there's, Another question Oops. that is, is there any empirical work out there estimating what the actual empirical variance is? Um, sorry, let me, can I click on the questions to make them bigger? I'm not sure if I can see. I don't think they can be made any bigger. I can read it oh, for okay. you if you'd like. Is there more after what the actual genetic? <laughs> no, I think that's it. Okay, okay. Um, oh, there, there so, is, there's, it's after, sorry, it's after what the actual genetic variants might be. Um, okay. And you should be able to resize the, the boxes if you pop out the question. Oh, today. so. I, yeah, um, I, I feel like I've, yeah, it's definitely popped out. But yeah, anyway, so just to answer, to answer the question, yes. And um, there aren't so many for corals, but actually, um, I think some of the, Basically, I think we were in a realistic range in what we tested. So I think the highest we tested here was V equals 0.1 or 0.2. And I think from what I've seen in the literature, people have um, maybe up to like 0.6 um, even. So uh, I think depending on the system, uh, 
right. I mean, I think they could be quite high. So I don't think these are unreasonable. Um, however, I think, I don't know, it's way more heterogeneous than how we've implemented it, right? So in our network, we just had that one level of V and it's, you know, it's probably not, uh, not correct. So yes, there are empirical estimates, but they're just not enough that we could actually like pop them in at a site level, which would be amazing. Um, okay, at the end of the second question, there are three plots. Okay, oops, let me, sorry, I can't, so, <laughs> I, why is the coefficient why is the coefficient smaller? Can you guys see the rest of the question, Andy? I can. Um, okay. uh, why is the co why is the coefficient smaller in the coral triangle compared to the other two locations? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's many factors. So um, even so, for example, um, there's we, we kept the dynamic, so um, a lot of those parameter values were similar across sites, across regions, um, but what was different across the regions were the connectivity matrices. So even the underlying assumptions um, that went into those simulations um, were different. Some of them incorporated larval behavior. The coral triangle actually did not. Um, they were purely based on passive particles. Um, also could be differences in the temperature profiles. So it's it's tough to know exactly what caused the difference. Uh, also, for example, the Coral Triangle had, you know, order of magnitude more sites than the other ones. Um, so, so yeah, uh, in terms of actual magnitude, uh, I can't point to a particular factor, um, but at least kind of these qualitative shapes um, are pretty similar. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it starts getting super complicated when we use real systems, right? Because there's just no control there, basically. Um, uh, could you, so, yeah, could you read me <laughs> Lucas's <laughs> question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Lucas says, great talk. Uh, I'm wondering if you've considered how these results might apply to populations with mobile adults like some marine fishes. The climate change conversation on marine fish is focused a lot on movement and dispersal. Have you thought much about how the mobility and population structure of marine fishes might alter the general patterns you've seen in simulated reef dispersal networks? Yeah, yeah, uh, totally, Lucas. I've definitely thought about this quite a bit, right? And what's tough is that, so here um, we have this assumption that the coral population is adapted to its local environment. But then if we're thinking of something that, like a highly migratory fish, I don't know, not quite sure what we can track, right? I mean, it's like what, what environmental aspect are they tracking? What separates, like what, what separates them from other populations in terms of that, um, local adaptation component. So I feel like that's, um, I have thought about that. And I mean, that's definitely a limitation here. But so uh, it's really, I mean, we can model it if you could figure out what that um, adaptive signal is, right? It's like, what are these populations adapted to? Um, and it's probably not, it's probably not from a specific place. Maybe it's like a collection of uh, the different spots they go to. Um, so, so yeah, sounds really fun, but tricky. Um, okay. Oh, man, I really, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I, I could read it Dan. again. Okay, uh, so Dan's uh, talk, yeah, or Dan's yeah, question. Uh, from Dan Ovando. Uh, he says, great talk. Do you have any thoughts on what an empirical strategy might look like to test some of these findings? Yeah, um, so I think, um, so even signatures of local adaptation, so uh, maybe reciprocal transplants. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I, might be, I might be butchering this, but yeah, I'm planning to work with um, molecular biologists and maybe physiologists, because um, 
we need to find out first and foremost um like what like are these are populations locally adapted or is there some kind of gene swamping happening or i mean really the question boils down to what is the scale of adaptation right so um what i would do if i knew how to do this was i would pick sites that we knew were connected maybe from uh, you know pop gen studies that so we know they're connected because of their um, neutral markers, right? So we know they're exchanging larvae. Um, second thing I would do would be to figure out um, under what temperature conditions those um, individuals from those populations um, would grow best under, right? And so if you can imagine two different patches with two different profiles, if there was strong local adaptation at each of those patches, you'd expect that they would match their environments perfectly. There was some indication of gene swamping. For example, you might see that um, individuals are actually adapted to just one, um, just one of the temperature profiles, or they could even be adapted to some average of the two different patches. So um, I think, yeah, I think showing that um, certain population or basically reconstructing those growth curves. Um, I think I think that's the key here. Um, that would show a signal of local adaptation uh, versus gene swamping or network adaptation. Okay. okay. Last question. Yes. All right. Uh, Sean Rohan asked, in the larval dispersal simulations, how do you source sync how do source sync dynamics work among sites? Is transport allocated proportionally based on currents? Yeah. So, um, so in the in the first part, uh, I basically made all those links the same in the regular random network, so they all had the same strength. Um, but in the real networks, um, those are based on the strength of the current, basically. Um, so it's kind of interesting because there is there can be a strong decoupling between sites that are, you know, close in space versus um, sites that are uh, strongly connected through circulation. So you could, in you know, Cartesian coordinates, you could have sites next to each other, um, but there could be some oceanographic uh, barrier that prevents them from ever exchanging larvae. So yeah, in short, um, those strongly depend on currents. Some of the simulations, again, also had some uh, larval behavior and mortality in them, but um, as a first approximation, yes, they're based on um, currents. Okay. Well, thank you, Lisa. That okay, was a great talk. Thank it was super you. interesting. Um, oh, that's all the time. Heard. What's that? Okay. Oh. Um, that's all.